You're listening to Retail Disrupted, a podcast that explores the latest industry developments and the trends that will shape how we shop in the future. I'm your host, Natalie Berg. Today, I am talking to Nick Bubb, who I have had the pleasure of getting to know recently as part of our work on the KPMG Retail Next Think Tank. Nick is a founding member of the think tank, so it's been a privilege to join him and hear his views, which, of course, you will be hearing today as well. Now, I know many of you know Nick or will have read his commentary in the media. He has been a leading UK retail analyst for over 40 years and more recently, a retail consultant. He also writes the widely respected email note, The Daily Retailer. Nick and I are going to be unpacking the Christmas trading results today. We're going to be looking at the winners. We're going to be looking at the losers. And we're also going to hear why the electricals retailer Curry's is Nick's pick of 2024. Now, Nick told me before we got started that this is, believe it or not, his very first time on a podcast. So I am super excited to have him here on Retail Disrupted. Nick, welcome to the show. I know I have just done a little bit of an intro, but maybe you can share a few words about yourself and your background to get us started. Yeah, sure. Hi, Natalie, and uh, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I worked in the city as a as a sales side analyst for for many many years, uh, places like Morgan Stanley and so on. And I retired uh, 10, 12 years ago, set up my own business as a retailing consultant, and I still write a daily blog about retailing. And my focus is still really on the on the quoted retailers, you know, the ones with share prices. You know, the M&S and the Sainsbury's and the Tesco's and the Next, um, rather than all the the privately quoted uh, private companies. So I look at share prices all the time, and that's maybe a good and a bad thing. But um, just to explain my, my kind of background. Yeah, and that's why I thought, Nick, you'd be the perfect person to come on and talk us through the Christmas trading results because they are coming through thick and fast now. We are halfway through January. So far, I think they've been surprisingly positive. I also don't think they've really reflected the official numbers that we've seen coming from the BRC or even Barclay Card, which, of course, tracks consumer card spending. So I guess to kick us off, Nick, I'd love to get your top line view on what kind of Christmas you think retailers had. And then also if we could dive into what's behind this discrepancy, do you think it's just clever PR spin or is it perhaps a timing issue and we just haven't heard from some of the more poorly performing retailers yet? Yeah, I mean, there's an old adage, but good news comes early and you know, remember Little and Aldi rushing out there. Christmas trading figures, you know, which didn't include any like for like figures, et cetera, et cetera, um, soon after the new year. Um, there's a lot of people haven't reported yet. Um, by definition, we're reaching a stage where they would have probably had to have said something because of the stock market regulations. Um, but we have had two profit warnings, JD Sports and, and Burberry. Mm -hmm. And and share prices have generally been under a bit of pressure, having performed pretty well through 2023. Um, both the food retailing and the general retailing sectors are running down a bit. Um, so far this year, M&S was hit quite hard, even though it held a profit forecast. Sainsbury was hit hard by the stock market, even though they held profit forecasts. Yeah, small upgrade from Tesco, but clearly both Tesco and Sainsbury are taking market share because of the the big success of their loyalty card schemes. But that's hitting other people. Um, the Kantar and the Nielsen overall grocery market data imply that Asda and Morrison's uh, suffered badly. They haven't been talking about their Christmas trading. Uh, we haven't heard from Waitrose, but it's pretty clear they had a a disappointing time and um 
I think the evidence is that through retelling was was quite polarised, um, perhaps more so than than usual between the winners like Tesco and Sainsbury, and Little, uh, and, and the losers uh, like Asda and Morrison's and uh, and Waitrose. Um, I think some people were disappointed by the Aldi figures, actually. Um, oh, that's interesting. Sent up given all the space and inflation, so maybe they shouldn't have been boasting. <laughs> so I think the the overall surveys were right. Um, I mean, they're pretty comprehensive figures. I mean, we haven't heard from the ONS, which include infamously or famously the, the smaller retailers. Um, but those figures are heavily overstated. Um, the ONS, the Office of National Statistics figures, I think, are very overstated. But the PRC figures implied non-food was really quite tough, as the retail think tank uh, expected. Uh, that was also the Barclay Card figures and the BDO high street spending figures. So if the average was a little bit disappointing, you know, there were winners and losers. Um, clearly, we haven't heard much from the online players apart from one small one, Marks Electricals, the fast-growing electrical retailer who talked about a high promotional environment. Uh, a number of other people, including um, Sainsbury's business Argos, talked about a highly promotional environment. Um, so I think margins are under some pressure, both in non-food and in food retailing, actually. I think Nielsen said on food retailing that it was the most promotional Christmas for for several years. Yeah, that's that's a really good point, both on kind of grocery and non-food about, um, I guess, at the moment, we're mostly hearing about top line sales performance. And of course, you, it, you can't compare like for like because of, you know, different trading periods and, um, and mm. whatnot. But I think you're right to call out that we don't know the true cost of all of this pre-Christmas discounting just yet. And uh, JD Sports, who you mentioned, they did cite this as one of the reasons for their recent profit warning. So they said, you know, the weather was mild, shopper demand is still sluggish, and we had to discount a lot. So that's, you know, directly impacting their, their bottom line. And I'm hearing from a lot of retailers that shoppers went in early for those big discounts. And then retailers didn't really get that last minute rush that they were hoping for. So... I wonder what your take is on this, Nick. Do you think there will be potentially quite a big impact on profitability as as we get um, those results coming out in the coming months? Well, two of the big players in non-food have already reported, M&S and Next. And obviously M&S is recovering and taking market share. Obviously, that's food and non-food. Um, Next is a very, very well-managed retailer, so they've got a fantastic online business, so so they've been taking uh, market share. Um, and they seem to manage their, their margins quite well. But clearly, JD Sports found, both in the UK and in America, um, the market quite to be quite promotional. Um, price points being pushed too high by, by Nike. So evidence there that that both sales and margins are under some pressure in, in sportswear. And clearly costs are going to get to be a bigger problem um, later in, in the year, particularly after the, the rise in the, in the minimum wage and, and business rates. So Black Friday always tends to pull some demand forward. I don't think Black Friday was anything to write home about in terms of, of, of demand, but it always has that effect. And the more it reduces full price or pricing power, uh, the more difficult it is at the Christmas to get people to pay full price. I mean, obviously JD Sports found that uh, a particular problem. Yeah, no, I'd agree with that. And um, I think that those retailers that abstained from the Black Friday frenzy seem to have done pretty well. So m and for example, said that they had their highest full price market share in non-food for over a decade. And uh, I called out M&S on the last episode with uh, Paul Martin of KPMG as 
you know, one of those interesting retailers, we were talking about it before they had it actually announced, but we we're just mentioning how, you know, a few years ago, M&S would have been the first retailer out there with uh, discounts, a lot of blanket discount and kind of 20% off everything. And I, you know, I am uh, a pretty loyal M&S shopper and <laughs> I was kind of checking the app every day and, and waiting for them to join the craze, but they just didn't. They did the kind of 12 days of Christmas, very targeted through their, their app. But um, I think, you know, it's probably a strategy that that's paid off. And they said that they're entering, they've entered 2024 with a spring in their step is how they've described it. So I thought that was uh, yeah. really interesting. And then just just briefly to your point about sports um, and leisure, I noticed just this morning that Sweaty Betty, another one of my favorite brands, <laughs> listing through all my favorites this morning. Um, but Sweaty Betty is also finding life difficult, and they just uh, announced that they uh, they made a loss. This was the year to January 2023. So this, we're, again, we're not comparing uh, like for like here, but I think it's interesting to call mm -hmm. them out that they are also you know finding life difficult right now, and you know demand is is soft and especially when you've got those high price points and, and a lot of competition out there as well. So um, maybe this is a good time, Nick, to get your thoughts on some of the losers. So you, you touched on JD sports, you touched on Burberry and the broader luxury slowdown that we're seeing uh, Burberry, of course, isn't alone. We also have, you know, LVMH finding life difficult right now, but if we go back to that Barclay card data, the sectors that they called out that really seem to struggle in December, uh, again, no surprises. It's those big ticket discretionary sectors like DIY, yeah. electronics, furniture, sports and leisure. Who would you say, or which sectors, if you don't want to call out specific retailers, but who would you say is struggling right now and what might we be able to learn from them? Well, we've already heard from a couple of electrical retailers, Marks, Electricals and, and Argos. Would you hear from Curry's on the 18th of January? We should hear soon from AO.com. And I think it'll be the same story that you know, consumers are finding it difficult to make ends meet. So big ticket spending has been cut back. We're due to hear shortly from uh, Dun Elm and DFS. Unfortunately, we're not, gonna, we're not due to hear from John Lewis, but clearly two thirds of the John Lewis sales mix is, is big ticket. It's electricals and homewares and furniture. So, it looks like John Lewis had another poor Christmas. And I think we haven't heard anything from on, um, Asos and Boohoo. Pretty awful years, really, given the swing back towards storytelling. I think what will be interesting turning to the year ahead is, is how Fraser's stake building in those two companies will, will play out. The motivation is, is hard to read. I think they see it as a each way bet. If Boohoo and Asos, you know, went bust or, you know, had to sell stuff to make ends meet, then I think Mike actually still wants to get hold of Topshop and uh, Debenhams. I think he's still very, very sore about losing out uh, and indeed losing money on his other ill fated investment in, in Debenhams. But I guess. On the other hand, he may well think, well, they could recover, in which case he could make a bit of money. You know, he sold misguided to to Shane or Shine or however you pronounce it. So so quite what he wants out of uh, Asos and Boohoo is, is unclear. So mm. but I think it will become clear <laughs> by, yes. by the end of the year. Either they will recover or they will go bust. You know. Yeah, that's that's interesting. And. I do want to come back to the switch to store-based retailing, as you just um, highlighted with ASOS. Interesting, because ASOS has actually launched their first physical pop-up store. Oh, uh, they launched it over Black Friday in London, and I thought that was interesting coming from a mm -hmm. retailer that has for a very long time resisted the urge to move into bricks and mortar. But um, we'll come back to that in a, in a minute. But first, before we move on, you touched on John Lewis and... Last week, you were quoted in Retail Week, and George McDonald, the editor of Retail Week, described you as a longtime follower of John Lewis's fortunes. And so I thought mm. it would be remiss of me not to get your thoughts on John Lewis here. Now, we know department stores are fighting tooth and nail to stay relevant to customers. John Lewis, mm. despite being a much-loved brand with a ton of heritage, is going through a particularly rough patch. So... 
would love to get your thoughts here, Nick, on what went wrong at John Lewis and maybe how do you see the brand evolving in the future? I think it will be a, a strong online brand for, for many years to come, hopefully. Um, and the current cyclical problem of their bias towards big ticket spending um, will eventually move back in their favor. But the structural problems of space overspacing costs is is tough to deal with. And clearly there was a very unfortunate legacy left by the expansion of uh, Andy Street. I mean, the, the infamous store he opened in Birmingham will live long in the memory. There was a relentless focus on opening new space at the same time as, as growing online. And uh, that never ultimately made sense. I think the cultural problem of the John Lewis partnership has always been that they've been very top line focused. They love talking about sales growth. Uh, they hate talking about profits and profit growth. In fact, under Andy Street, profits went nowhere. Sales went up a long way. And uh, there's never been enough focus on costs and margin management. And though I, I, I really, really like Peter Roos, I think he was a really strong appointment as the new MD of John Lewis. A bit of me thinks what they really need is someone who's a little bit hard, hard nosed about cost cutting and, you know, focusing on, on the cost base. So I hope, I hope he's learned how to control costs and won't be afraid to take the right decisions because I still think John Lewis is overspaced. I still think they will need to close stores despite, as you say, the swing back to uh, physical shopping. I mean, the fact is they're as, as big as M and S in, in total sales terms, but they are losing money. And that must be because their cost base is too high. So that has, that has to be addressed. Uh, I know the central costs of the partnership, which were staggeringly high a few years ago, are gradually being addressed. But John Lewis itself needs to focus on that. And we haven't talked about Waitrose yet, but that is not without its problems either. <laughs> Yeah, and, and it'd be good to get your thoughts on Waitrose, but I guess just um, a brief kind of point on John Lewis. I think if you look at department stores generally, the ones that are still, you know, just getting it right, despite all of the changes, despite the fact we're living in this digital era and like, let's face it, the department store model of everything under one roof just really isn't as relevant today as it was kind of 20 years ago. But, you know, if you look at Selfridges, um, I mean, Harvey Nicks has had trouble and I think that's probably more linked to yeah. the luxury slowdown. But I think, you know, Selfridges just continues to get things right and do really kind of crazy and eccentric things to keep shoppers talking and coming back. But, you know, how many stores do they have, right? They don't have 30, 40 stores across the country. So I think oh. it's it's this uncomfortable truth that we do have too much department store space and probably needs to be addressed. And then just just briefly, I guess my other comment um, based on what you said about John Lewis is you look at their competitors like Next and they have such a such a grip on on cost and strive continuing to strive for those operational efficiencies. And I think that's something that, you know, MS has really um, tried to grasp more and more of uh, and think they've made, you know, significant improvements in recent years. So in a time where you pointed out wage inflation and business rates going up in the coming months. You know, it's it's uh, absolutely critical, especially when you've got a an operating model that's uh, costly and perhaps just yeah less relevant to shoppers these days. So, lots to um, to unpack. But I'd love to get your thoughts on on Waitrose and kind of where you see them going. Well, that's not making much money either, um, and it's losing market share to M and S. Um, you look at the average Waitrose, it looks badly underinvested. The stores look boring, you know, particularly in contrast to the fantastic stores that M&S Food uh, has, been, has been opening. Um, I haven't seen the new store concept um, that Waitrose has opened, but they need to do a lot more of that, uh, invest far more in the stores and the back office systems, which are creaking. Um, and they really, really must get this loyalty card launch right in the spring. 
it's been a very long time coming. Um, but there has to be better data. Waitrose has no idea who their best customers are. Uh, they've got to address that. Uh, they've got to encourage cross shopping with John Lewis. Obviously, there are some stores which are co-located, and, and that should be a uh, should be a given. But it's not happening. Though M&S is a formidable competitor in food, there are also middle class customers migrating towards Lidl uh, and Aldi as they open more stores in in the southeast, as they become more accessible. Uh, and Waitrose is still a very very expensive place to shop, and it's not surprising that their shoppers are, are trying to make um, make economies uh, by shopping elsewhere. So yes, it's a strong brand, but I think it, it, it too has has problems. Yeah, that's a really good point too about the um, sort of switch from the more premium supermarkets, not down to, you know, Sainsbury's and Tesco, as we would have seen maybe 10, 15 years ago, but the switch right down to the bottom of the food chain, if you will, the Aldi's and Littles. And I think that's that you're right. You know, they're opening in better locations. They're way more accessible. And they've put a really big focus on quality in recent years in order to capture that mm-hmm. switch and, and sort of, you know, acknowledging that shoppers are looking to uh, shop smarter. Frugality is very, very acceptable these days, isn't it? So I think it's, uh, it's interesting to see how they've captured some of that share. And again, it goes back to the whole point that you can't sit still in retail, that you have to keep moving and keep innovating because if you don't, others will, right? Now, Nick, I'd love to get your thoughts on the physical store because you've already touched on this switch back to store-based retailing. For a long time, e-commerce was seen as the death knell for the high street. There was this fear, right, that um, that online retail would kill off bricks and mortar. But, you know, fast forward to 2024, and I think we all know that is certainly not the case. Not only can these two channels happily coexist, but actually what we're seeing is this rapid convergence between physical and digital retail. And I think something that's particularly interesting is how we're seeing more and more of Um, those retailers who started life online are recognizing the value and having a physical presence and also recognizing the halo effect that it generates um, and, you know, kind of counterintuitively, it ultimately drives e-commerce sales. We've seen this with Amazon. We've seen it with ASOS, whether that's in the form of uh, permanent retail space or pop-up shops. We just heard uh, just in the past week that Gymshark is opening permanent retail space. Avon, a brand that is over 100 years old, is finally recognizing the need to move into stores. There's a lot going on. So would love to get your take on store-based retailing. And what do you think some of these moves into physical retail by the by the online players what do you think this tells us about the future of the high street? Well, I, w- I wouldn't get carried away about you know, one or two small brands doing this and that. Um, the bigger picture is really, you know, who would have thought, what, three years on since the pandemic, that people would just still be going around uh, without masks, um, all that wretched hand gel we all had to use. I mean, didn't, it just didn't look like re- store retailing would be that popular um, <laughs> so quickly. And I think that's still surprising, but I think a bit of it is just a swing back to meeting people and getting out and about. And I think a little bit is, is also driven by the cost of living crisis. I think people you see interviewed say, we find it easier to control our spending. If we go to stores, we can see the deals and the discounts. Uh, It's just harder to do that online. And obviously you're paying online for delivery one way or another. And I think people are trying to save money. Yeah, I completely agree with that, Nick. I think especially in grocery, we have seen such a major return to the store. And again, I think if it wasn't for the cost of living crisis, then maybe some of those pandemic habits, uh, the the broader shift to digital, maybe that would have stuck a little bit more. Um, I still think that grocery is one of those categories where having a physical presence is always going to be essential for retailers. I, you know, it is one of those categories that 
it's unique in that we're buying groceries every week. We're also creatures of habit. We like buying the same stuff. And you can argue that that actually lends itself to, you know, online grocery shopping. But um, but to your point around uh, the cost of living crisis, driving this return to store based food retailing, I completely agree. And I think not only can shoppers have better um, visibility over their their budgets and their shopping lists when they're shopping in store and they can also avoid those delivery fees as you say but also it gives them the option of shopping at the discounters because as much as Aldi and Little have dabbled with e-commerce I think the reality is that the economics just don't stack up if you're a discounter and you're business model requires you to run a really, really tight ship. You've got a limited range. You know, you, you strip out all the bells and whistles. You're all about operational efficiencies. Well, you know, you can't deliver groceries. It just doesn't work. So really, really interesting stuff, Nick. Um, just if we move on now, I, I really am keen to get your take on if as we look to 2024, uh, I w- I'd love to know who you think the winners and losers are going to be. So let's start out with the winners. Who should we be watching this year, Nick? My tip is uh, is Curry's. I think Curry's could be a, a interesting stock market um, performer, at least. Well, I say that having picked m as my tip for, for last year, which was uh, rather, rather successful. So... It won't be easy to match uh, the m and share price performance because <laughs> that more than more than doubled and um, the Curry's is so far down a bit so far this year. But I think three things could go Curry's way. One is the, the margin recovery in the Nordics, you know, the jewel in their crown historically, hopefully will continue and we can see some profit recovery in that, in that key business. And secondly, it does look as if mortgage rates and interest rates will be heading down in the second half of, of this year. That should relieve the pressure on big ticket spending. At a time, thirdly, when hopefully the replacement cycle will be starting to move the way of electrical retailers, you know, three years on since we're all rushing out buying laptops and home office equipment and everything else for working at home during the pandemic. It could be as well the Olympics and the Euro football could prompt a little bit of TV replacement. Um, I think they could all do with a bit of a laptop replacement cycle <laughs> kicking in. So I, I hopefully Christmas 2024 could be quite good for the electrical retailers. Um, I just have that feeling, um, which would be true of obviously Argos and IO World and Mark's Electrical, so they would be um, people I'd be looking at for a, for a better year. A difficult start, but hopefully a, a good end to the to 2024. That's really interesting, Nick, and I think will probably come as a surprise to a lot of our listeners, because all we keep hearing about is how it's those big ticket discretionary um, purchases that are continuing to be pressured. But I think you laid out a really strong and compelling story. So uh, certainly something to watch. Now, I really hate ending on a negative note, but one final question for you, Nick. Who is going to be struggling in 2024? Yeah, there's a couple of companies I I want to keep an eye on. Um, one is Pets at Home. I think you might know more about this in the American market, the evidence that people are starting to cut back on on pets and spending on their pets because you know people have um, you know have to make ends meet and uh, and so far Pets at Home has has said you know, pet ownership is still increasing. But I, I don't know, a little bit of me thinks that won't continue and that people will, will start to make some economies. So I, I just watch out for pets. And the other one is boots. I mean, clearly they've had a, a massive recovery, uh, belatedly, from the pandemic. Health and beauty has been one of the strongest, in fact, the strongest non-food sector. Uh, people getting back to work. Women buying beauty and fragrances, cosmetics, that will make sense. 
but the comps are now quite tough. Has Boots really become a business that can keep on growing? Its stores don't look in particularly good shape. A few flagship stores being opened, as we all know, but investors will clearly have to make up their mind. If, if Boots have enough momentum to get to an IPO point, uh, investors will then have to decide, is it fairly priced? What are the future prospects? Maybe a loser is the wrong word, but it will be an interesting year for, for Boots. Nick, as always, super interesting to talk to you and to get your thoughts. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having Retail Disrupted as your first ever podcast. And also thanks for the tips for 2024. I think some of those were a little bit of a surprise to me and probably to a lot of listeners. So it'll be really interesting to see how it plays out. And uh, yeah, we'll have to get you back on the podcast in January next year. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Natalie. Thank you for listening to Retail Disrupted. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to support the podcast, please leave a rating or review or share it with others. It really makes a difference.